Okay. New reading source starting this week in week three, you might have noticed, um, we'll be starting it. Uh, whatever reading source is in the module, that's what the quiz is going to be based upon. This week's going over network uh, standard and OSI. And so uh, I believe it's like five questions, if I'm not mistaken. It'll, it'll be that way each week. So I found another resource that we'll be using. We'll be also using it next week, uh, going over network standards. And uh, so just look for it in the task area of that week. I think I've worked ahead three or four weeks ahead. So the reading's all in there. The quizzes aren't in there, but the reading is if you want to read ahead. TechScope Tuesday um, is a RBC program using Periscope through the CIS division that highlights um, RBC programs, faculty, staff, tech news of the day. It's Tuesdays from 3.30, 3.45. All you need is a phone and per the free Periscope app, and that's it. You can also, if you don't have a phone, uh, you can hop on Twitter and view it that way as well. If you can't make it during that time at all, it is recorded and posted on my RBC. Org. If you go to our course homepage, there's a link called Periscope that shows you how to set up. We roughly have right now about 75 followers on the Tuesday show. I'd say probably a quarter of my RBC students. The rest are just people in the community and wherever else that want to watch it. We have folks like uh, President Mike Mastriani joining us this semester. The next two weeks, though, we have RBC students. Next week is Greg King, which is graduating this May. Greg's going to U of I. And, or take it back to Illinois University. And I wanted a perspective of a student getting ready to graduate and then a student just starting school. So the third two weeks from uh, Tuesday is a student that just started school last semester. And so they'll talk about tips and tricks that uh, they found as a new student, also as a student leaving Rock Valley, some things they'll share, some positives, and some things they had cha challenges with. I'll have them share both. You also find out things like their favorite music, um, hobby, stuff like that. And with, you know, faculty and staff, a lot of times we don't share stuff like that in our classrooms. We just don't have time. So this is a way to kind of highlight uh, their personal life a little bit. And you get some interesting, um, you know, interesting things come out. In fact, last semester we interviewed uh, our dean for our division, uh, Rich Goke, and he plays for a uh, Radio Stars. He's a guitarist. He's been playing for about 25 years awesome guitarist. Anyway, he uh, we talked about, pretty much we talked about guitar, guitar because uh, I play guitar, so we talked about pretty much guitars the entire time. And uh, I showed a really cool picture I found of him like in the late 80s, early 90s, long hair, jamming out on the stage. And so he gets kind of gets to see some cool pictures and um, maybe some embarrassing pictures possibly, which that's okay. Uh, when you're in teaching, and especially in limelight, you're, you tend to take that as a grain of salt. It's going to happen. Uh, with all the flaws that we have and, and idiosyncrasies, they're going to all come out. So anyway, it's a lot of fun. So if you've never been a part of Periscope, it is a lot of fun to just watch it. You're not in the, we don't see you. All, all I do is see that people have joined. That's it. And so how many has ever done Periscope before? I know Russ has, a number of you have. So I definitely encourage you to do it if you can. If you can't do it, tell others about it, because I know some of you have classes. And then if, even if you watch it afterwards, you can post your questions on Twitter. Uh, we interviewed Abby Garcia, our, our resident uh, Twitter girl and camera girl. That's not my words, it's what she said. And so she's been in the Rock Valley for a couple, two and a half years. And uh, I teach photography, and so we talk a lot about photography. And she does photography on the side and uh, has got a really good uh, Twitter page and Facebook page. And that leads me, I guess, to the last point I'll mention about TechScope Tuesday. We have what's called show notes from TechScope Tuesday that are part of the discussion. Uh, that way, if you uh, you know want to remember links or pages like Abby talks about, her web page, it's going to be on there. So tonight, we're going to talk about network standards and OSI model. And uh, then we're going to watch a video for our lab you might have seen it in the lab section. Before I forget, because I always do, go into the lab right now, end of week three, and submit your name so I can uh, give you the 50 points for listening to the video without falling asleep. Now that's the caveat. You have to watch the video without falling asleep. 
it, hopefully it won't be that hard. It's only like 13 minutes long. So hopefully it's not that boring. Um, I was reading some of the, I never do this too, by the way. I was reading some of the comments on YouTube about this video. Cause it's, it's been out for a while. And majority of them are pretty positive, right? But then you also, if you've ever been on YouTube and read comments on a, a maybe you liked a video and you've read some comments, you're like, wow, these people are really angry. <laughs> uh, I did that a little bit tonight, so I recommend not doing that, especially right before you get ready to uh, show a video. Probably not a good idea to do that. Uh, anyway, we're going to look at some uh, organization standards that are set up in OSI and networking. We're going to talk about OSI and then uh, some of the specific functions that OSI has in more detail. We'll also look at some of the structure of OSI, two types of models uh, in OSI that are covered. So when we talk about standards and, and networking, we're talking about um, documented agreement between uh, two parties, two or more parties. And here in the Rockford region, there's a lot of, um, still is a lot of manufacturing firms that deal a lot on what we're talking about tonight, which is documentation, specifications, clarifications, um, to do with parts, to do with, um, mainly with parts. So when they do an order for, a, uh, say they're setting up whatever it is that they're selling, they're going to have some type of documentation and standards for that setup, uh, yeah. whatever it might be. In networking, it's the same way. There are certain standards and documentation that Granted, you don't sit by the fireplace and read them because it, you would go to sleep, but they are there to help all these other businesses that make networking equipment like routers and switches and NIC cards and, and modems and cell phones. If there wasn't a standard, no one would talk to one another as far as devices. And so these standards help devices talk to one another. And um, now there are some downsides to standards. We may not have globally in the U.S., or not globally, in the U.S., we might not have the fastest available network standards uh, out there right now, technology-wise, because of standards, if that makes sense. Because it takes a lot of red tape to get things passed in standards, just kind of like, I guess you would say, in Congress or something like that. So there is, by the way, in standards, you'll see tonight, there are governmental folks or business folks, there are uh, people in the organization that do the work involved in standards. So there's there's worldwide standards, there's, global, there's um, uh, standards referring to certain countries like the U.S. We have certain standards that we apply to that China doesn't have to apply to, uh, that Germany doesn't have to apply to, and then vice versa. And so Standards give a, what's called a minimal acceptance of uh, performance. So example, when you buy a brand new server, right, there's minimal standards for that server on how much memory it should have, how much hard drive space it should have, uh, what its network speed should be. Those aren't optimal, they're just minimal standards that this server's going to meet out of the box. Anything extra that you want to do to it, you have to pay for it. Uh, but you guys are probably used to that when you're buying anything electronic. You have your base product you buy, whether it be a phone, whether it be a modem, whatever, computer. You have a base product, then you can add on it more memory, more hard drive space, stuff like that. Make sense? And so there's a standard minimal acceptance performance, not ideal, but standard. So there's many organizations that oversee um, computers within the world. There are a couple is ANSI and IEEE. We have about two or three meetings a, a year here on campus with IEEE. Um, and they do have a student chapter, by the way, on IEEE.org. IEEE.org has a student chapter that you can look into. And they um, are basically a society of, of professional networking folks that set together um, electronic engineering standards but also included in that is computer programmers, um, electricians, engineers, um, is all in the mix of IEEE. And then network professional groups, there's tons of them out there. We'll talk about the most popular ones tonight and what those, what those groups do. So ANSI is the American National Standards Institute. It's a thousand representatives from both industry and government. 
Uh, it determines electronics industry standards and some other smattering fields, but mainly electronics industry. It's voluntary compliance, uh, meaning companies that create products for the electronics industry can volunteer or must volunteer, don't have to volunteer, it's a voluntary compliance. And if you pass the ANSI standard, you get a little ANSI sticker on your company and on your products, really your products on your company. But there are companies that say they're ANSI certified, and they can say that. They have so many products that are ANSI certified. Um, they have rigorous testing. They, but, but basically what happens is if you make a new product that's electronic in nature, we'll say it's um, um, a video doorbell. That's popular right now. Where people can buy these video doorbells, anybody can buy it, put it on the outside of your door. And when people ring your doorbell, you see their face. You watch, you can do it with their phone, your phone, and watch them. Pretty popular. Um, there's standards to that technology. One would be communication standard. Does it use RF technology between the device and the phone? Does it use Bluetooth? Does it use Wi Fi? Whatever those standards are, this. Um, ANSI organization would make sure it fits within those electronic standards for those devices. We'll go through testing uh, to determine if it passes its mustard. Um, EIA is the Electronics Industry Alliance. It's a trade organization, mainly dealing with manufacturing. So here in the Rockford region, we have a lot of uh, EIA Alliance companies. And they set standards for its members. They also help right ANSI standards that we just talked about. And they go down to Springfield and places like that to lobby for laws favorable to um, all computer companies uh, dealing with um, companies dealing with accessories for computers and networks basically. TIA, telecommunication industry, it was started in 88. Um, EIA subgroup was merged from a former U.S. Telecommunications Suppliers Association. And then the focus of TIA is basically wireless, uh, satellite fiber, and telephone equipment. And so when we do the cabling lab here in a couple of weeks, you'll see on the cable itself, EIA slash TIA standard 568B. That's the standard for that wire. And it, they put their stamp of approval on it for networking professionals to use it within organizations that are a part of this group, uh, which is if you're an organization that um, wants to be supported by all hardware with networking, you're going to have a 568B cabling because that's all you know. All the plugins, all the hardwire NIC cards have to apply to that standard. So it's guidelines. One I just mentioned, the 568B series, is guidelines for installing network cables. We'll be doing that in here. You'll learn how to use tools to create your own network cables, to hook to your computers, to hook to a, a switch to be able to talk on the network. And there is a standard for that on what what wires are, are needed, what uh, level of plastic sheath needs to be around those wires, uh, the quality of those wires. Um, you know, the list goes on and on of all the different standards. IEEE is the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, and it's international in nature. The goal is to promote development and education. They're really big in student chapters around the nation, and they help with both electronic, electrical engineering students and computer science field both. So that would be programming, if you're going into programming at all, mobile programming, Windows programming, Android programming, uh, if you're going into uh, engineering at all. Um, this group is uh, good to be a part of. They have a magazine that comes out every month. They have competitions yearly. Uh, they have free um, resources for students. They host symposiums around the, the world. They have them in Germany. Uh, they have them in Africa. They've got them in the U.S. Uh, they have conferences, local chapter meetings that meet here in the Rockford region or, and down towards Chicago. Um, they maintain a standards board. And they have what's called white papers or technical papers uh, and standards. So really thick papers on everything you can think of from wireless to wired uh, technology. So ISO is an international organization for standardization. They're headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland. 
They are representative of 56 or 57 countries. And the goal of these, this group here is to establish um, international technology standards, technological standards to facilitate global exchange of information and very free trade. Uh, they have widespread authority. They work a lot with third world countries wanting to get um, uh, internet capabilities for all of their peoples. Uh, and so they will basically work uh, with government to help get what it is that they need when it comes to internet, when it comes to satellite, um, or even computers. They work to help to help the areas get computers at, uh, in schools and libraries and things like that. ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, these work closely with the United Nations, with you knowing about history about the United Nations. It started in 1947 when the Nation of Israel came about. Uh, the United Nations uh, is a part of and sprouted from, the ITU sprouted from this uh, United Nations forming to provide support for small countries like Israel uh, to help with telecommunications, fiber optic, wireless, wired uh, equipment. The focus is global telecommunication and worldwide internet services throughout, specifically those small, smaller countries, uh, developing countries that maybe can't afford the infrastructure like the U.S. can uh, to put, put fiber all over the nation or put telephone poles all over the nation. So this group will put in ad hoc uh, satellite stations for children of all ages, for schools to get access to internet, things of that nature. The um, U.S. military has helped a lot in many of these groups, especially this one. Um, I have a cousin that worked, uh, had four or five tours in Iraq, worked with this group to get uh, internet in uh, schools in Iraq. And this is, this is part one group that helped funded that initiative. And so they have a lot of people give to the United Nations that also funnel through this ITU telecommunication union. A lot, a lot of good things they do. The no, no, another one is ISOC, Internet Society, began in 92. Uh, right about the boom of the internet, that's when the boom of the internet really started, where uh, consumers, internet was before that, but consumers started getting all their houses, uh, you know, mom and dad, brother, sister, you know, grandma, grandpa started getting internet. So the society came out to establish some internet standards, and one of the big things they've tackled here in the last five years is a growth of the internet. Exponential growth, saying if we didn't do something, we would run out of IP addresses by 2025. So what they did was they changed the standard of IP version 4 that we ha we did have for years to IP version 6, which all of your NIC cards have capability to do, which basically gives you uh, close to a trillion more IP numbers available than IP version 4 does. So it'll be good well, well into the future for um, networking. Because every website, every business is connected to the internet has to have a unique IP address. And so that's what this group was focusing on and spearheaded the, the move of moving away from version 4 to version 6. And we're still doing that, by the way. We're still moving into version 6. Version 4 still works fine. Uh, and here we use version 4 sometimes in the Cisco classes. Excuse me, we do as well. But version 6 is where everything's moving. So ISOC uh, continue, they work with specific missions like the uh, Internet Architecture Board that as a, it's an advisory group that oversees the overall worldwide design and management of the Internet. Al Gore is the leader of this group. Just kidding. Um, he probably he's probably leader of this group, I'm guessing. But I don't know. Uh, IETF, Internet Engineering Task Force, these guys set Internet standards for communication. Uh, they have particular protocol in what's called in the operation interaction of the internet. Anyone and their brother can submit a proposal, but you do have to follow certain guidelines of that proposal, like the way it's structured. If it's not structured right, they don't want to look at it. Uh, they have a very elaborate review, testing, and approval process. And again, this this group does a lot with like say new protocols. Possibly. Let's talk, talk about that for a second. New protocols to help with video conferencing, like we're doing tonight. You know, maybe we need new protocols to help help that speed that up, 
and what are those protocols, how they're going to affect the internet in general if we were to open up these protocols. And so that would be an example of what this group would review, test, and approve. The internet protocol addresses, which is called, you know, IP, which you guys have heard of, uh, basically just has every computer both internally on the network and externally. Uh, internally on the network, you're going to have certain IP address ranges that are dealing with classes of internet addresses. And you basically have classes like A, B, and C, and even D available to us. This, this uh, group um, it relies, centrally on, relies on centralized management authorities. And the history of this group kind of uh, is a, a montage of different groups altogether. Initially, they started out as the IANA, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority. Then in 97, uh, it split to three RIRs, Regional Internet Registries. And these folks were responsible for keeping track of all the IP addresses that companies had, that websites had, things of that nature. So you had the American Registry for Internet Numbers, Asia Pacific Member Information Center, and then Rizal uh, IP Europeans um, all over in France and that area. So in the late 90s, though, it became ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Numbers and no Names and Numbers. It's a private organization, non for profit, that does remain responsible today to uh, for IP addressing, domain management, and IANA performs all the administration stuff. So data entry, uh, going to governmental meetings, things of that nature. Users and businesses obtain IP addresses from your ISP. So an example would be um, if you buy a website through GoDaddy. GoDaddy will not give you your ISP, will not give you your internet, I'm sorry, your internet address. You'll have to go through like Xfinity or if you're going to host this at home or a, a workplace. They'll give you a static IP address and that's the one you plug in and give to GoDaddy. Now GoDaddy, uh, if you don't have um, a business, and you are wanting to just buy a website through GoDaddy for them to host it, that's a different story. They're hosting your website on their servers. Then they will give you an IP address because it's their servers are running off of. That makes sense? But if you're running off of your servers at home, at home or your business, you're going to have to get your internet, uh, your IP number from your ISP. Well, and around here would be like uh, it's, you know, Xfinity, AT&T, Verizon, just to name a few. So OSI uh, basically is just a, a model we're getting ready to talk about that helps us determine what area of networking we're talking about for troubleshooting, for mainly for troubleshooting, mainly for troubleshooting. I'll just say that. So it was developed by the ISO in the 80s, and it divides the network into seven layers. Uh, physical, data link, network, transport, session, presentation, and application. Its protocol interaction is that it, it re interacts with the layers above and below it, um, and it interacts with software. It is not software, but it interacts with software. The application layer does. Then the physical layer interacts with the NIC card and the cables on your computer. So you've got your Cat5 cable going into your NIC card. It's going to interact with that on this uh, physical layer protocol. So we have application layer, physical layer. Theoretically, um, it represents um, between two nodes. And we'll look at a screen here in a second that will show two nodes communicating to one or to another, two computers. It's hardware and software independent, even though it deals with hardware and software. Um, every network communication process is represented. They have what's called uh, protocol data units, PDUs, uh, discrete amount of data, has what's called an application layer function. And it flows through layers 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. And it is a model, and it's sometimes imperfect. So here's an example of the two nodes. On the left side, you've got a node. On the right side, you've got a node, and they want to communicate uh, to one another. So you'll see on both sides the OSI layers. So we'll start here on this side here on the left. 
uh, we'll say uh, this computer here, we'll say has, uh, has RBC Eagle, like you guys have tonight, and you log in, right? And you went to the lab, put your name in. Well, you fired up, um, what browser did you guys use? Somebody tell me what browser you used. Firefox, there you go, you started up Firefox. So it works in the application layer, Firefox does. It's not a application, Applica the application layer is not a application, but it deals with Firefox, which is an application. Then it goes into presentation layer, and basically what, it, and you're sending, I'm talking about you sending your name to the, the lab folder, goes into presentation layer, um, which is getting ready to convert it here in just a second, and the session layer, and the session layer is all about keeping things alive, keeping that session alive while he's submitting his name into Eagle. The transport layer is getting ready to convert the digital or the analog, um, whatever structure it is that program uses, uh, text, I guess in this case, it'd be ASCII, just plain text, converting text into digital. And because the way computers work on the network is all in zeros and ones, binary, and that's it. So it's getting ready to do that here in the transport and network layer. The network layer deals with, um, whoop. the network layer deals with the, an ID of some type, because the net card's going to have an ID from the network. Data link layer, which is the one right below that, it's going to go into the, um, I'll use this to be easier. It's going to go into the, um, getting ready to go into the net card of his computer. And now it's all been digitized into the physical net card. Going over here to my computer, we'll say this is an Eagle server. We'll say this is an Eagle server. Uh, into the physical Eagle server net card, going through the data link, getting ready to convert it from digital back into whatever version it needs to be, which is text. It finds out the ID of the NIC, uh, network ID. Uh, transport layer is begin and session layer, keep it alive. Presentation layer goes, oh, I know it's getting ready to go into whatever browser on their end or server. We'll say it's Firefox on this end. The person on this end sees it, which is me. Uh, and I see that he's submitted his name. It's going to create it. It's going to come back through the same process, and then he's going to open it up later, sometime down the line, to see that there's been 50 points added to that lab gate. So the OSI model does all that, and all it does is the reason it's nice to use is we'll say it fails. I don't get it for whatever reason. So let's look at the different layers. Um, we could start at the very top and say, well, Firefox just crashed. That could happen, right? So that's that layer. Then we would go, well, Firefox was fine. It's still running. It's not Firefox. So what about it timed out? That could happen. That would be the session transport layer, level three and four. Um, and, and, and Eagle will time out eventually if you let it sit there long enough, right? And so that would be the level... OSI layer that we would say, well, let's look at layer three and four, which would be the session transport. Then if it has to do with addressing, say uh, my network doesn't recognize his IP address and it blocks it, it could be maybe because his IP address is not kicking out the right data. And so might need a new IP address on his side. So a number of different reasons, but the reason the layers are important is it kind of lets us put in the spot what it is that needs to be done, and what it is that needs to happen, uh, what we need to troubleshoot. So, application layer is a very top layer. Hey, Jim, how you doing? The very top layer of the OSI model. There's no software involved. Um, it's protocols, facilitates between software and the upper and lower level of that application layer. It interprets the application request, which in this case is sending data, sending text back and forth. And it interprets data from the network, to and from the network. In this case, just sent from the network. So software in the application layer negotiates uh, the layer protocols. It formats them, adds procedures to it, security to it, synchronization to it. Then the presentation layer, which is right below the application layer, it accepts the data layer and formats it. And the example would be like encoding. So 
if we were uh, pushing a video through Eagle for me to see, it would encode it from that video file to whatever encoding needs to be added to it. So the MPEG code, maybe uh, movie code, uh, maybe if it's an audio file, it might be an audio code. Also, the presentation layer will manage encryption and decryption of that function. Then session layer, as I talked about earlier, deals with communication. It's, it's handshaking all the time in this layer, making sure you're, you're connected, you're connected. It's just constantly going, are you connected? Yes, I'm connected. Do you still want to be connected? Yes, I still want to be connected. It just does it all the time. And that's the session layer. So it keeps the data connected while you're talking, while you're communicating to that. And then the connection between the remote client and access server and the web browser and the web server. So the functions on this one besides uh, connection will be secure communication. Also, um, if a transmission failed, it could restart it. So have you ever downloaded a file before and it started downloading and it stopped? Have you ever had that more? Or for it was like really slow. And then you went over and just refreshed your browser and it started up again. All right. So it fails sometime in the download process or slow down in the download process. The session layer is what's going to help us determine that. Transport layer is the next one underneath session. It will accept the session layer data and it manages end-to-end -end data delivery. And it has a, it's very connection oriented. It has what's called a checksum in there that basically um, determines if data arrived or didn't arrive. I want to see if Jim can turn off his microphone. <laughs> hey Jim, could you do me a favor and turn and mute your microphone? Just click on the microphone at the top and mute it. Yeah, the audio, the little microphone at the very top, just click on it because we're getting feedback on this side. Cool. Thank you. All right, and so the checksum will basically determine if the data arrived or didn't arrive. If it didn't arrive, it's going to ask to come again into um, to be sent again. So if the data that uh, you that you send uh, does not get received on the other end, the checksum is what's going to check it. And if it doesn't exactly match what you sent, it's going to ask for it uh, to be resent. And you'll see that in the video that we do tonight. Uh, and this transport layer helps determine that. It's connectionless in protocols. Um, it doesn't establish connection in the transport layer. It makes no effort to ensure data is free of errors. Its job is to make sure data gets there. That's it. And it also has what's called segmentation. And in segmentation, what I like to do on this one is you know, talk about uh, a train with cabooses, multiple cabooses on the train. Save a 15 meg file you're sending. And to be simple, I'm just going to say it's going to put five megs uh, of data in each caboose. And then on the other end, it's going to do the check to make sure it's the 15 megs. Check. Make sure that the uh, file name is the same check, make sure the IP address comes from that IP address that the source was, check. Then what it's going to do is these five separate uh, cards that are coming in, it'll put them all back together and reassemble them on the other end automatically through the segmentation. And so it increases speed because you're breaking up the data. So even if you have slow connection, this will help make sure data gets there on segmentation. And so you can have dial-up, you can have internet, you know, through Comcast, very fast. You can have the fastest internet in the world. It's still going to use segmentation to make sure data gets there. It also has what's called a maximum transport unit in this layer. And all you need to know about this is, is for every caboose, there's a certain amount of data it can hold. 1,500 units, uh, bytes per car in the train, basically. 
So whatever that division is that needs to be, it'll do it. Then I, I, I talked about already, it reassembles it on the other end and resequences them back from beginning from zero to whatever. So we'll say this is car zero, this is car one, this is car two. It's going to reassemble them here in that order. So here's an example of uh, segmentation and reassembly. So you've got on the left side a message, a long message that goes through the segmentation and you'll notice it splits up every letter into the caboose, one letter at a time into the caboose. And then on the other side, it takes that segmentation and then reassembles it for the user to see um, or the program to see. So the sender sends a message, it goes through segmentation, and then it's reassembled on the other end. Here's just a screenshot of what a uh, transport layer looks like um, as far as protocols go. You'll notice you've got, it tells you the port number, it tells you the source port, the source destination port. Um, the other thing I want you to look at is the options at the very bottom where it says maximum segment size 1460. That's what would be in each one of the segments. Even though the max is 1500, this one used 1460 per segment. Network layer is the next one. Network layer basically, like your NIC card has a, its own um, ID, your network has its own ID as well. And every computer is given a separate network ID and it decides on that network protocol how things are routed on your server. Okay, So from your computer to my computer at home or the server you're clicking on to find a video tonight, uh, it determines the the route of that data internally, what's going to happen. The addressing is by the system. The network gives us an I, a unique network address, just like your NIC card's unique. And your, your, your uniqueness is kind of like your VIN number on your car. Anybody familiar with that? Anybody familiar with the VIN number on your vehicle? You've seen it in your insurance, but it's somewhere in your car. It used to be years ago well, on the dash right underneath the windshield. But today it can be under your dash, it can be under your seat, it can be a number of different places. And usually it is. So basically it's just the uniqueness is because if you don't have unique addressing, you can have collisions in communication. And so there's two types of nodes when it comes to network layer. You've got network addressing and then logical addressing. Network addressing is done by the server, it gives you a network ID. Um, Logical addressing is where you can break up, as a network administrator, you can break up different segments of your network to do certain functions. So if I wanted um, a segment of my network just to be data, I can do that. And I want a segment of my network just to be voice, like through phones, I can do that. And then the packet information of the network is appended to the very end of that data packet and it's added to a routing uh, system of some type to where the network data goes from point A to point B. Um, and if there's other considerations of routing, like network congestion, network collision, uh, the network layer will figure out what needs to be resent if something fails. Because things do fail when you are downloading stuff or when you're sending stuff. It fails all the time. We don't see it, we just know that we just got our data. But you might have had thousands and thousands and thousands of fails just to get the 100% data that you got that you were downloading. Whether it be from Eagle, whether it be from a music you're downloading, a movie you're downloading, from say um, iTunes or something. There's multiple fails, but the whole beauty of networking is it, it rectifies itself and fixes it. Uh, and if something's missing, it'll last for it. So the other thing about network layer is it's a there's what's called the IP, the internet protocol within the network layer. There's a part of that network uh, protocol. And then lastly, the fragmentation within the network layer, which is a lot like the data one before, that just subdivides the network into little smaller packets. On this one, all you need to note on this screenshot is that You've got 
down here really is better than reading up here. Your source um, address and your destination address. Okay? The source address and destination address. So in this example here, I can just tell by the numbers here that the source is outside the building and this local 10 dot number is only for local internet, intranets, local LANs. So this is a, maybe like a, a, a packet, data layer packet from something that, outside the building coming in. And notice this header checksum, it checked the fact that everything came in fine, packets were checked, and it was correct. And so you normally don't see those because, you, again, you just uh, see that your data made it successfully where it needed to go or you received your data that you clicked on. Data link layer. This one is basically dividing the frames into um, from the transmission into the physical layer. We're getting ready to hit the NIC card. We're getting ready to hit the network on this one. So we're converting all of our data that's that we're sending from whatever format it is into digital format. And that what it does then is it sends it into what's called a frame, which basically takes what's called the payload, which is the data that you're sending. It could be text, it could be video, it could be voice. Um, getting ready to send that into what's called a payload that's going to dump it into a digitized packet across the network. So there are what's called possible uh, communication mishaps that can happen. Like, for instance, Maybe the checksum fails. What's going to happen is it's going to ask for a resend of the part that failed. It will know exactly what part failed, what Caboose's didn't come over. So if Caboose 3 didn't come over, it's going to ask for that one uniquely. Because in the checksum, it checks every Caboose to see if they came over successfully. So if it missed Caboose 2, it's going to tell the network, I need Caboose 2 again. It'll, re it'll repeat it back to me till I get it. Also, there could be a possible glut of information and requests that comes in that can cause errors to happen as well. So there are errors that can happen, but the, what's nice about networking is that if an error occurs, it'll rectify itself and ask for that data again. Two types of data link layers, they have what's called a logical and media access. All you need to know about these is that one deals with um, Vendor, and one deals with network. Vendor would be your MAC address, um, and the MAC address would be what's like on your NIC card. It has a MAC address, right? It's literally written on the NIC card itself. It's two parts on that NIC number. Um, there's a six-character sequence unique to the vendor, like, say, 3Com would be a popular one, or Intel would be a popular one. And then there's a device ID that's uh, a six number added at the factory of the vendor. And again, it's going to be unique and it's going to be controlled by that vendor. So MAC addresses are usually depicted in what's called a hexadecimal format. And we'll actually look at what that looks like this semester. I'll have you look at some data on your hard drive and show you what hexadecimal looks like um, and help you understand in conjunction to uh, juxtaposition to uh, like an ASCII text, what hexadecimal looks like. In America, we don't use hexadecimal uh, every day, so it's going to be something foreign to you, but I'll kind of help you understand it, what how the computer looks at it. So here we have on the screen a data link layer that showing you subdivisions of media link, which again is more uh, driven by manufacturer, like a NIC card, and then the logical link which is going to be driven by the network within that network. So it could be like within the computer itself, within the network itself, is going to deal with a logical link control. Here's a screenshot of a NIC card. Circled in red is the MAC address. That MAC address is going to determine um, that MAC address is going to determine what's actually in the network address uh, packet. And these can be spoofed. And uh, in my 130 class, we do a spoofing lab for MAC addresses. Um, if we have time this semester, we might do one. But it's basically where you, if you find out a MAC address, you, you know, the reason hackers do this is 
so they can guise themselves as another person on the network by spoofing their MAC address. Same thing with IP addresses. And the easiest MAC address is to spoof on laptops because wireless laptops or wireless NIC cards, you can just go in and manually type in the, the MAC address that you want. A little bit more difficult on PCs, but you can do it with the right software. Now we're at the physical layer. We went from application all the way to physical layer. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it, buddy. Hey, you want to wheel around and say hi and wave to everybody? Can you do that? Why not? I can definitely hear you now. I've helped, I can hear you good. You put the headphones on? Okay, cool. Well, do you want to turn around real quick and wave to everybody before you sign off? All right, because they've been looking at the back of your iPad. There you go. There's Jim. Wave at him. And they can go all, wheel all the way around the other side and wave to the group behind you on your left. You'll have to slide over. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Did he disconnect? All right. Come back around here, buddy. Hey, I appreciate it, Jim. Oh, he's gonna go. He's he's not gonna do He's not done. <laughs> this is awesome. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it, man. Good night. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for doing this. So the physical layer deals with the, the actual NIC card itself. So we're getting ready to go out the out of, to the NIC card. And what you're seeing at the top here is what we just came from. The data link layer uh, generates a signal of voltage because the NIC does have the, it's not enough to shock you, but there is some voltage in the Ethernet, uh, in Ethernet. There is some voltage. In fact, there's a product you can buy, I don't know if you guys ever heard of it, it's called Power Over Ethernet. You can go out to uh, any networking store and buy them. What it is is you get two plugins that literally plug in your wall, right? Little boxes, uh, a little bit bigger than that. Anyway, at the bottom of the box is an Ethernet port, plug in Ethernet port. Then you take another one of these devices, plug it somewhere else in your house, doesn't matter where, plug it in, put an Ethernet cord in there, and you can connect your network through power, um, which most people aren't aware of that. So. You don't want to spend money. It's about the same money, by the way, as wireless router, but it's faster because you're literally wired as much faster on communication than wireless, right? That makes sense. Uh, so you spend, say, 70, 80 bucks on a wireless router. It's about the same for uh, power over Ethernet devices, two of them. And then you can literally connect wired to your router from your ISP, wherever it might be in your house. It would definitely be more secure. Yeah, you're not broadcasting anything. And I had one years ago, and uh, we lived in a rural area and uh, didn't have uh, good reception on Wi-Fi anyway. So I got I bought a couple of them. It was about that, that that time was like 120 bucks. Now they're like at 70 bucks. So it's really reasonable. About the same cost as a Wi-Fi router. You guys are the best buy. So if you ever get a chance to get one if they're on sale or whatever, pick one up. I think you like it. So, but there is a little bit of voltage in the Ethernet cable, again, not enough to shock you, but it trans it transfer voltage through a copper cabling that signals go through, and the voltage is also going through it. That's the voltage is what actually causes a signal to travel, basically, just enough for the volt just enough voltage for the signal to travel. Fiber optic, um, instead of voltage, it deals with light pulses within the line. And there's glass fiber optic and plastic high-end fiber uh, glass, high-end glass, and then high-end plastic. The difference, by the way, between uh, Cat5 copper cable and fiber optic is distance. Fiber can go miles at length, usually, like a quarter mile easily on a fiber run, whereas Cat5 can only go about 300 feet max. On average, you want to keep it around 200 max. But fiber can easily go a quarter mile before the next hop. Yep, and it bounces and moves and yeah. Whereas in the Cat5, 
Yeah, well, Cat 5 after after 300 feet begins degrading in a data flow because there's only so much voltage can do over a certain span of distance. And there is a delay, you're right. You get a delay as well if you go longer than you're supposed to go. It could time out, be very kind of choppy at times. Yeah, for sure. And then what they do is, and we'll talk about this semester, you can put on a wired side on, for Cat5, you can put like repeaters or just hubs or small hubs or routers to make it go to that distance. Um, so you got fiber, you got copper, which is Cat5. Um, wireless, which we know what that is, it uses electromagnetic waves. And there is, you know, my grandpa got me into this. My grandpa was into, it was a physicist, by the way. He was a farmer by the time I knew him when I was older. Uh, by the time I, you know, could talk. He would already retired and was a farmer, so that's all I knew him to be was a farmer. But before I, before when I was, before I was born, he was a physicist, uh, worked at Kansas City and Life. So anyway, at five years old, he used to try to teach me about gravity and physics, physics, and specifically electrical waves in the air. I remember him talking about that when I was six years old. I'm like, <laughs> and so, but what what really turned the light on for me was, and you guys have maybe seen this before. My grandson loves this. You take two magnets, right, that oppose each other on the poles of the magnets. You put them on a table, and you put them close together, and then the other one starts moving as you're pushing the other one, you know, that that got it right there. I was like, well, what? there's something there. There's got to be something in there that I'm not seeing. He said, there is. It's electricity. Everything's made of electricity. Then the light, then the light came on. I'm like, wow, there's stuff everywhere. I don't even see it. And, you know, it's true that everything around us is evolved around electricity. And um, wireless, though, is more susceptible to electricity and waves and degradation and collision than any other medium that we have in networking. That's why it's really not used today in high-end military cases because of, you know, not only being hacked into, but just it's just not reliable enough. Because anything can cause a you know a drop, a, a bird, a, you know maybe I mean, not a bird, but a flock of birds, or a or a you know a fence line or something like that. Yeah, solar flares can do it as well, and so reflection of light uh, can do it. A noise can do it. Um, other other vying electronics around it can do it, like electrical lines. So wireless transmission has come a long ways, but it's still not, I don't know if you knew this or not, but it's still not widely used at all in military exercises. None. We're still old school when it comes to military communication because wireless isn't there yet. And so a lot of the way we do communication has been a way we've been doing communication in the military for years. Uh, voice, you know, if I'm sending a message to a troop, I send somebody. Uh, whether it be by helicopter, whether it be by foot or whatever, uh, because wireless really isn't reliable enough. Now, the, the one area is, do what now? Yeah, well, secure communications help, but the problem is it can be intercepted. It can, it can still be intercepted, even on wireless. And that's the only medium that can be, the only medium that really is susceptible for high-end interception is wireless. So, but I will tell you this, the positive news about wireless is the military is a, is a medium by which we test cutting edge Wi-Fi. They're the ones doing all the cutting edge stuff right now. And so when we, what we get now, military is probably a good five, ten years ahead of what we have in the U.S. and in the, around the world, legally anyway, as far as communication goes. So when I say they're not using it um, for wide scale use, they're not. But that's not saying they're not using it for, co you know, covert type of operations or small scale type stuff, because they probably are, because I know that they do have the technology to do it. We don't have it yet, but the military does have it. So, and that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. Well, here's the, we do this lab and, yeah. 
yeah, you want to do any finance, you don't want to do any, you're checking uh, Facebook, I mean, even the Facebook, well, I would say, because a lot of people keep their cards in Facebook now, credit cards and stuff, because they buy ads and stuff. But, so, you know, like this little device I have right here, I brought in tonight to help with the robot, right? You know, everybody has like AT&T, Verizon. This was a dollar. This was literally a dollar I had to spend for this, for AT&T, to add it to my package I already have. One buck is what it costs. And all it does is it casts out. I can connect up to 10 devices to this. And uh, it's 4G LTE strength. I mean, very good, very good strength. But very secure, too, because it's my, it's my connection. It's my, it's my internet. It's my, it's my Wi-Fi. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, somebody could learn, you know, hack the password and find out what that is and then get into it. But, you know, we made a difficult password. It's not going, it's going to be less, less susceptible to hack. But no, I always tell students and anybody that's asked me the question about Wi-Fi, everybody has a smartphone now and everybody has internet on their smartphone. And most people don't realize you can even turn on the share the internet feature to your laptop or to your tablet if you don't have cellular in those. So you can turn on the little hotspot swipe that I have on my phone. And most of your phones have it, but I'm surprised how many people don't use it. Now, so, used to years ago, it would cost extra, but most providers add, it's actually a part of your deal. It's a part of your base package. It's everybody wants to, um, that knows what they're doing anyway, wants to have their own internet. They don't want to get onto the McDonald's. They don't want to get onto whatever Wi-Fi that's out there. Home to use their own because it's more secure. You do have to turn your Wi-Fi to get. You just swap. Well, what it is is when you. No, that's fine. That's a good question. When you turn on your hotspot on your phone, it allows you to connect your tablet or your laptop to your phone instead of to a hotspot at McDonald's or something like that. So it's your own internet you're sharing with yourself. Yeah. So it's much more secure. I definitely recommend it uh, because you know we do a lab in 130. It's called Man in the Middle Attack where we do it on that computer right there. Benita's at. And what I do is I put up a bogus Facebook page, right? I spoof a Facebook page, Facebook site, have everybody come in and say, okay, guys, go to Facebook, but log in with a bogus username and password. I do not want you to use a username and They know what we're getting ready to do. Log on to the bogus username and password, go to facebook.com. They do it. I kill the hack. I come over, show them to my computer, and I go to a PHP page I've created that keeps track of all the passwords and usernames I just collected in the last minute. And boom, just they come over and see all the username and password they just entered in. And when I turn off the hack, uh, all they do is, you know, human nature is, and this is scary too, when you forget a password and then it sends you to the next page to, oh, you forgot the password, enter it again. Within two minutes, it's been proven that people will use every password that they know that they use within two minutes. That means a hacker has literally got not only your Username, they already have that, and probably your email. But every password you've ever used currently and are currently using in their possession. And so that's what this hack showed was it had a regular Facebook login page, right? It failed, went to a, a login fail page. On that page, the students did on average five to ten passwords on the fail page. And I asked them afterwards, you know, I told them before don't use, use a bogus password. But I, you know, I deleted the database, but I said, how many honestly use passwords that you use now in that lab? And they go, <laughs> and so, because, you know, you can only think of so many passwords. You can only think of so many bogus passwords before it's actually your password you're even thinking of. And so, yeah, that happens all the time in, in Starbucks and especially free Wi-Fi areas. Starbucks, I mean, a lot of places have free Wi-Fi. Culver's, Starbucks, uh, McDonald's, where, where else you guys go to? You probably see it, but. Everywhere is free Wi-Fi now, right? So you really don't need it, though, because, again, most of your phones have it. And so I would share that knowledge I just gave you. If, if you already know it, share it with other people, because you would be surprised how many people do not know they can they have their own hotspot in their pocket, basically. They don't need to be connecting to any Wi-Fi around them. They really don't. So, yeah, definitely, that's a good question. Okay, so wireless technology, fiber optic, copper on the physical layer. On the physical layer, 
We also have things like um, your hubs and your repeaters and your switches connected to the physical layer. And also the NICs, as we mentioned, it's also on the physical layer. The physical layer protocols, though, as far as responsibility for receiving data, uh, they detect the signal, they pass it to the data link layer, they set the transmission rate, they monitor data error rates, like collision lights on your NIC card are usually yellow. If it's good and healthy, it's usually green lights. But if you see yellow lights on your NIC card on your laptop or your desktop, generally you can see them on your laptop, desktop you can't see them. Um, this usually means collision, it's a co congestion on the network. And NICs both work on the physical layer that we're talking about now, and the one right above it, which is a data link layer. So here we have application layer, presentation layer, session layer, transport layer, network layer, data link layer, and physical layer. And all of these layers talk to one another and can overlap one another. And again, it's just a model to help networking folks to determine, in my experience, to determine troubleshooting. What's, where is that? Say, so we'll say stuff like it's in layer four, layer three, layer four, or maybe if it's NIC related, it's layer one, layer one layer. And there's actually companies that will say we specialize in say layer three of the OSI meaning they specialize in the networking layer of, uh, you know, switches and routers, uh, configuration of devices, and troubleshooting those. So communication between two systems, um, we've already talked about the NIC as helping with the communication, but what really is a part of that communication besides your NIC and your wired, wireless, or fiber is the data itself, the payload. The payload is what's being pushed through the network, and that's the most crucial part of the whole piece. Because you can, you know, get internet, you can communicate, but if, it's, if the data's not getting there, then it really is a useless network. The data doesn't get where it's supposed to be. And so, data transformation, converting it from whatever to digital, from digital to whatever. Um, PDUs, this is generated in the application layer. Segments, we talked about how it segments the data into packets to get where it needs to go. And then those packets are put into frames and then reassembled. Encapsulation is in the data link layer where it begins to wrap each one of the layers with information like source IP address, destination IP address, source MAC address, destination MAC address, things like that. This is a more uh, real representation of how they overlap. You'll notice, for instance, um, data, network, transport. We'll, we'll look at those right there. Data, network, transport are one of the ones that really overlap the most. And then the next will be like, uh, the next three that overlap together and work in conjunction will be application, presentation, and session. Those three work together well as well. And just because of how they're fit on the OSI. So frames, all you need to know about this one is, um, Ethernet frames today will be the most popular one, will be the IEEE 802.3, developed by Xerox, which, um, developed, by the way, the, what we have today in our Ethernet uh, technology with our wired Ethernet really has a lot to do with Xerox. And what is what do you think of Xerox? What do you think of? When you think of Xerox? Yeah, they're copies, right? And really, though, they're the first company that really utilize networks a lot because they use their copiers to connect to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, and hundreds of thousands of people uh, in business anyway, in the early days. And so they perfected that Ethernet technology uh, for speed because when you're sending boatloads of data from all over the building to one printer, you need to really understand the, the communication on, uh, on Ethernet. And so these guys spent years doing it. And so IEEE 802.3 uh, is your wired standard. Okay, that's what we're going to look in the back of the, if you guys want to turn around and look at the white and blue wires back there and red wires, 
That's the Ethernet standard. That's the wired standard. Then we have uh, IBM created what's called a token ring for Ethernet 802.5. Remember, that's the one we talked about last week that has for every time you send a packet in a token ring, two other computers are part of that data until it's completely sent. And then Ethernet frames and token uh, ring frames differ in the fact that they can interact with each other, but devices can't support one another uh, per a NIC interface, mainly because I think I told you last week, and I think I did, that there is in a ring topology, a lot of times the computers will have two NIC cards, one going in, one going out. And so that has to do with the standard 802.5. Then 802. Um, dot three is present day Ethernet standard, and then 802.11 would be wireless. So you guys have today like 802.11 uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way up through N. Uh, most of most of you are using N, I believe, probably at home. I'm guessing, and then you can, if you've been in your router, you may be seeing with stuff like mixed mode between like N and G, or N and B or NG and B, all three, and those are all 802.11 standards, is what that's called. And so these are all the standards available. I won't read all of them. The one most popular would be 802.11 wireless, 802.3 uh, Ethernet that we use present today. The ones you may may not have heard of probably is 802.15. This is what's called a per wireless personal area network. This coexists wireless personal internet network with other wireless devices in unlicensed frequency bands. This would be like what military is possible using in their testing, is unlicensed and unstructured, but they have freedom to do a lot of stuff with that. Uh, 802.11.16 is broadband wireless. This one's actually used a lot in the U.S. and worldwide in what's called WiMAX. In fact, I had a student do a, a, I know you guys already submitted your paper topics, but I did have a student do one on WiMAX. Anybody heard of WiMAX before? It's literally citywide, citywide or, or region-wide internet. You just, you just can connect wherever you're at within a certain range of this WiMAX device. Clear Communications, the one closest to us in Schaumburg, and the Clear Communication in Schaumburg, if you go to Schaumburg Mall, they actually have a, they have a store there, and they will cover all the way up to about 25, 30 miles from Rockford, if I'm not mistaken. And I heard they're coming here soon, like within the next three years. And so the way it works is on clear communication is uh, you literally, once you sign up to the service, now granted the closer you are, the stronger your signal, but within 30 miles of their service range, you should be able to get connectivity on any device if you have service through that. Uh, you have certain, on your home, you have to have a certain uh, hardware device that you have to get. In your car, you can get a certain hardware device too to use. So, but that's a, a newer technology in the last four or five years. It's really, really uh, sprouted. 802.11.17, uh, basically this one deals with ring topology. And then I'll mention the last one, which is 802.22, which is regional area, wireless regional area network. W-R-A-N. This broadcasts wireless through the UHF, VHF channels, which would be, you probably heard of those with TV. And so that would be the TV wireless that we have today um, would be high definition antenna that some of you might have at home. Anybody use the just regular antenna and not cable? That's what I do. Um, I don't pay cable anymore. Um, anyway, this is the technology for that, 802.22. So, let's go into the video. Okay, now again, this video is not real long. Let's see here. 13 minutes exactly. In fact, I said that earlier. 13 minutes exactly. It's very informative, but you don't get to the 50 points, you can fall asleep. <laughs> so after the 50, after the video, I'm going to turn the lights on very quickly. Let's see if you fall asleep. No, just kidding. But, that, but after we're through the video, we are done for the night. So I will start this, and then I will turn the lights off. And thanks for letting me have Jim come in tonight. I hope that wasn't too distracting. It was when you had the microphone on, but besides that, I'm okay. Um, I'm 
one go full screen. There we go. Arrive at their destination, 
e o que é que nós vamos fazer com isso? Nós vamos fazer com isso. 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 Nós vamos fazer com isso.
Okay, everybody's away. Good. Good point. Oh, I wasn't too bad, right? Not too bad, right? For a video. I remember one in high school. Anybody fall asleep on videos in high school ever? You do that? No? Oh, yeah. It is pretty awesome, though. But I remember one time in high school, we were in a shop class, and uh, a friend of mine was, uh, my granddad had the, the teacher wasn't that exciting, but anyway, he was talking, and we we stopped, and all surrounded him, including the teacher. <laughs> the kid was asleep, and he woke up. The teacher made some loud noise, and the kid woke up screaming, running out of the room. He thought it was a fire or something. But anyway, not too bad, though, right, for a video. I hope that nobody ran out of the room, so that's all right. All right, so everybody knows what's due uh, Sunday. You've got your quiz. Um, you turn in your lab, and then you do understand the reading has changed a little bit. I've got some different sources out there for you. And then next week we're going to be doing uh, ping. We're going to be doing ping uh, exercise in class for the lab. And there's reading out there already for that. And then the quiz will be posted by Monday, as always. And so we are done for tonight. If you have any questions, come see me. Uh, and if you want to help with uh, robots of any type uh, in the future, let me know. I'll put you to work.